So, hi and welcome. My name's Elizabeth, but I only get called that if I'm in trouble, you can call me Elsie. That's, uh, if I'm in serious trouble, you call me Elizabeth Solomon, then I know. <laughs> it's dire. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I teach here at the Hong Kong Academy, which is a bilingual private school, independent school, that has um, Putonghua in the primary, going to a 50-50 ratio in middle school. I teach uh, literature and humanities. Um, in the past, I taught, I began my teaching career, teaching at a high school in Israel, and I said, I'd much rather lick toilet bowls than do this. So I went back to university, <laughs> did my master's uh, in something completely uh, useless, but amazing. Um, translated documents from uh, Sanskrit to Hebrew, that was fantastic, and got poached by the head of English, who said, you must try teaching university. It is not as awful as teaching in high school. I taught there for eight years. In the end, while doing my master's, uh, I taught EAP. Uh, for humanities, I taught a, a course in post-colonial literature, which I really enjoyed. Um, from there, I, because I was following my husband, I moved to Japan, um, taught in the local system, which was, uh, how should I put it nicely, an eye-opening experience <laughs> um, and a great kind of welcome back to Asia, where nobody, I was in the worst school in Tokyo, I was a jet. If, if you know what that program is. And um, nobody wanted to or intended to do any study of English. It was fascinating. Um, my Japanese skills improved a lot. I don't know about their English skills. So from there, I again, um, uh, I won this competition, uh, British Council competition, got headhunted to teach in China, in Nanjing. Taught there for six years. Again, teaching IB, completely different. Uh, kettle of fish, very different, and then six years now in Hong Kong. I still miss teaching university, although the Asian students are much nicer than the Middle Eastern ones, I have to say. You know, in general, just nicer to work with. I do love my students, but I miss university. So that's a little bit about me. Um, two years ago, I started writing. Um, something I'd wanted to do since I was a graduate, but for practical reasons, because one has to pay the bills, didn't. Um, and I, which I regret now, but at least I'm doing it now. So that completely transformed the way I teach. Okay, it was a big game changer for me. And that's what I'm gonna try and share with you and how that helped me understand writing and be a better teacher of writing. Um, so, there's the little thing, okay. So wh why bother doing this, right? And I, really, on reflection, I, I feel that if you teach writing, you must write. Just as, you, you know, artists, you can't be an artist without doing art. And it, writing is an art form. And even if, because I still think my writing has a long way to go to be anything good, it's the practice that makes you better. It's being involved in, and the humility that it brings with it, the insights that it brings with it. So I know most English teachers or language teachers somewhere have a story in them, or five or 10. Write those stories if you're not doing it. It'll change the way you approach your teaching. I highly recommend it. It's painful, it's humiliating. It's one of the best things you can do for yourself as a teacher and as a human being. What did I find when I did this? So I'm using this image as an analogy. We've all taken CPR lessons at some point, especially when you work in high schools, you have to. And you know, there you learn the theory of, of CPR. You learn how to do it right and follow it by the book. You, you, you know, you, you really stick to the rules. There was a big study done comparing the teachers of CPR versus actual um, uh, people who do CPR. People who are actually in the ambulances doing CPR, not teaching about it. The, the gap was vast. And I'm using this as a comparison between teachers of literature, teachers of writing, versus real writers who are in the real world of writing. It's very different. I did not understand or appreciate it while I was just 
teaching literature, okay? Because when you teach literature, you have rules, you deconstruct, you read a lot, and you try to, to help your students, you try to give them rules. In the real world of writing, I found it's quite different and invaluable for me as a teacher. So, and as a writer, and so what have I written? Just, just getting warmed up here between being a mother of twins, <laughs> Uh, teaching in a crazy international school with high demands. This is what I've managed to write. I started with a light uh, non-fiction essay, which I really enjoyed, uh, writing in the Asia Literary Review. And I've joined the Hong Kong Writers' Circle, which is a local organization that promotes uh, local writers, a mixed bag of expats and Hong Kong writers or writers from anywhere, really, who happen to find themselves in Hong Kong. They have a yearly anthology. Um, this is the last one that I also wrote in and co-edited. Also, I'll just pass this around so you get an idea. The work is always about Hong Kong and is written fresh for every anthology. The editing process was also fantastic, but that's a different presentation. Um, and all of this has been very painful to do. OK, why? Because of the feedback that I have received. The initial ones, my resistance was strong. In, writing is intimate, OK? It's like giving birth in a way. And then people saying, your baby is ugly. We need to chop its arms, perhaps even change its face, and you're like, what? How dare you? This is, this is a slice of me, and, and you're saying it's not good. And that's about the piece about being an artist, is being vulnerable. I don't think, I think we can get comfortable as academics um, in our ethereal world of theory and forget what the real practice is about. You have to put yourself out there. Our students are all the time, whether it's as a tool, as we heard today for EAP, or whether it is for the pure joy of writing, right? They're putting a slice of the, you have to empathize. It, it's so empowering. Um, and yeah, th this is what they found. <laughs> that while we can talk about the theory, the practice is quite different, okay? And so I try to think, you know, what, what are my five big insights? So besides the intimacy, I found that I was rewriting rewriting, rewriting. Every time I went back, I changed something. Was I really ever happy with my final draft? No, but I had to stop somewhere. That's why I needed an editor to tell me, it's OK, this is publishable for now for this purpose. So always remembering that, because as language teachers, we tend to be perfectionists as well. And it's, it's very hard to make that switch from being and letting go. We know too much about language and mechanics, and we have these romantic ideas about writing. And we're not living up to our expectations. So I kept rewriting, but learning also when to stop. And that's why feedback was crucial. So yeah, real life writing is nothing like the theory of writing. Okay, It all sounds fantastic. I think out of all the writers who give advice on writing, I think Stephen King is the one who gives the best advice, because it's very honest to the practice, as it is today. Um, other writers I find very inspirational, but often perhaps a little bit too, should I say, just idealistic about their stance on writing. Perhaps they don't have to pay bills, or they're married to somebody really rich. I don't know. Um, but if you want to sell your work, there's a big difference between um, writers, as Nuri Vitachi said to me, Recently, he said, Elsie, my books get read, written, uh, read more than Salman Rushdie's books. OK? <laughs> and I'm known Salman Rushdie. He said that to me. And that was also very enlightening, because who, who are the writers who get read? So you have to decide, just as you do for anything else, are you writing for a commercial purpose? Do you want your book, your story to be read, uh, to, for it to be palatable? Or are, you are you just writing whatever's in you? OK, so that was another thing. Um, and most people are writing for an audience, especially today. There's a lot of writing online. There's a lot of mediocre writing online as well. You have to wade through a lot of mediocre stuff to get some, to get some gems. But there are good pieces. 
online they tend to be shorter, punchier, yet honest, the good, the good pieces of writing. And you have to really have an audience, uh, ability to trap your audience in, in your writing. Um, and yeah, those three words. Not the feedback that says good or bad, that doesn't help me. Perhaps I like it when it's good and perhaps you know my ego is crushed when I hear hmm, bad, but I can't do anything with it. Uh, so as a teacher, I struggle. I got back underlines and tick marks uh, uh, as a writer, you know, getting feedback on my writing. And I thought, this is not helping me. So I would often try and, uh, so I got into critique groups where you sit down face to face with people, you, you get feedback, you get triangulation. And if three people are telling you that this part, this, this is rubbish, okay? You need to change this and this is what you need to do to change it, not just rubbish and tell you why it's rubbish and what you need to do instead you probably should be listening to them. That's the humbling part th uh, that you have to accept. Okay, so lots of surgeries on, on your baby, so to speak. Um, and so taking this to my classroom, with teenagers it's even tougher because in the real world, nobody really cares about your emotions, right? You're in a critique group, they say, you know you're going to get critiqued, you're an adult, you can take it, even though you're crushed afterwards. That's why they, ha they invented alcohol, right? So you can just kind of, you know, get over. It's okay, it's okay, and then go back to it. But young people, you gotta be careful. You, you, you are building the writer in them. They don't see themselves as writers. Even writers of historical essays um, or, you know, scientific uh, papers, but readable papers, not just those papers that nobody reads. More and more there is a drive to, and a push, which I like, to make academic research more accessible, more readable, which I love. So they don't see themselves as readers. So what I felt I was doing was trying to give them this vision of themselves as, as a reader. So I felt that first of all, I needed to build this environment of trust for sharing, okay? Um, I had to find a way to give them this timely, specific feedback. And the lessons I found is the value was that the giving the feedback was as important as getting it. It truly is. I think one of my students put it best when he said, now I have razor sharp eyes on my own writing. Okay, after giving feedback, not after getting feedback. Because it's a process, this is a process, it's an art form, so it transforms you. Um, and you know what? When you write something, especially as a young person, you put it on paper, which I'm going to ask you to do soon, on digital paper. Um, and people are looking at your work, your engagement's going to go up. That's, that's a slice of you right there. OK? So you are going to find that if you use this technique, you're doing it in real time. They're getting feedback that you guide them to give proper feedback and they are so engaged. They love their own writing or critiquing. Sometimes I have to hold them back a little bit. Come on, there is something of value in here. What's the value? So you have to train them to give the kind of feedback that they would want to receive because they can very often, very quickly go into um, things that are not working. It's so easy to go there. Okay, but in most pieces of writing, there is something good as well. So that, that took some uh, how should I say, practice and awareness with teenagers, you know. They love to hammer each other's work. But the engagement levels were really high. Also, we don't do a lot of grammatical work. That happens, that, that's, we have, perhaps we highlight a few things if it's a recurring issue, but the feedback tends to be genre-based, ideas, some organization. Okay, so it's more looking at the content and ideas that you're expressing. You, you know, when you see a great use of uh, vocabulary, you highlight it. It's, it's not so much about correction. It's not the red pen at all. Okay, so that was really powerful. So the tool that I found most useful is the ladder of feedback. Um, and it's a simple but very effective tool. So this being a ladder, you start at the bottom and you work your way to the top. 
in reality, this looks like four sentences on one piece of very doable. Um, for IB schools, we all our work is criterion reference. So I will often use the criteria, um, the wording of the criteria, and look at their work. And that's what they also do. So I'm just going to walk you through the steps really quickly. And this is what the, this comes from, uh, if you've heard of uh, Project Zero, Harvard. You should look it up. It's fantastic. It's a great a critical thinking tool. They have uh, something called visible thinking routines. And they're fantastic for almost any subject. I've used them in history. I've used them in science, art, of course, English. So they have a whole free toolbox online, which is fantastic. Um, so step one, and it's very important with my young teenagers to give them the language of feedback, I found. So you ask a clarifying question, something uh, you're not, not really clear about the work. OK, so something global about the piece that you don't understand. So let's say you're writing in the Gothic genre. And the work doesn't, it's the opening paragraph. And it just doesn't have that, any features of the genre. So say, did you really want to write a piece that was Gothic? Or are you sticking to the genre? And you have to be careful so it's not really criticism, but something you don't understand, something you're grappling with. Who is this character? What do they look like? Let's say if you're writing fiction. OK, so you would, this is rung number one. Oh, and I use these little symbols. We don't use these words. My students now know to use these little symbols attached to it. So you'll see question mark and a question um, to each step. And they love it. They know I just say ladder of feedback time, and they just get into it. Students, I find, are very good with routines, thinking routines. So this has become a habit in our writing class. And this is how I give feedback as well. So it's modeled all around. Um, next step is to find something that works. OK, and of course, they love this. <laughs> yeah, everybody's uh, liking stuff. I, I guess I should use the like button or something like that if I really want to appeal to my teenagers. But they tell me that uh, Facebook is now for older people. Apparently, they're on other things that I don't e even know what they are. But anyway, so we use. We go on to the next step. We always find something of value. This is important as a habit, because they can get very critical about their own work as well. Right? They have to find something of value there. Um, then this is the part that is the most useful part, of course. What isn't working, but why? <coughs> this is where you have to be specific, just as in the what works section. Here, if you don't. Uh, specify what is not working. You're not helping yourself or anybody else. Mm -hmm. That's what, And then they always have the task-specific rubric next to them with the criteria. So you know, if they're not adhering to the criteria, they will use that language. That's a way to, I don't know if you do that here at university. If you have, do you, Shari, do you have cri criteria? Mm -hmm. We um, advise teachers to have this three-step feedback comment, okay. which identifies the problems and explains why it doesn't work yes. and how to. So it's individualized. That's so it sounds similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Slightly different. Okay. Yes. Um, and then this is again the most so giving the critique and then how to fix it. Okay. What do I need to do as a writer to fix this? What could make it better? OK? So those are the steps. Any questions about I think they're quite straightforward. It's good teaching nothing really new. Just the way it's organized is really effective. Any questions about this? If not, I'll move on to the next thing. So um, I'm going to show you what my digital classroom looks like. So you can say hello to my students. This is my one of my lower end class, middle years, grade 8 class. And they are all, this is a Google Doc. 
This is where they go for their homework. This is what they're working on right now. They're analyzing short stories. And we're going to have, because it's the end of the year, they're going to translate a short story into a meal. It's a creative task. And they have to justify it. The whole point there is to write a rationale. OK? Um, and they have portfolios. So I just want to sh show you. So if I were to click on Evan's portfolio, this is. He only shares this with me. This is between me and him. Of course, I won't tell him that all of you saw it and that it's on live video. But so we start of the year, you know, setting a goal for ourselves. These are very young kids. And here are all the tasks we've done throughout the year. So we, this is all created by him. And if you see over here, they'll see my feedback that they've had on the different tasks. There might be also peer feedback. They, so they track the feedback that they get. They set goals that are specific to the feedback, and they reflect on it. This is a reflective practice habit that I'm trying to get them into, not just looking at the mark. The mark is not going to help them improve. Mark just indicates where they are at the moment, if I really want to help them. And in the beginning, it's a hard sell, but then they see it working. They can write such fantastic reports about themselves based on, the, they start to get a picture of where they are in English, OK? And we do this, this is now the end of the year. So this is from the beginning of, uh, since August 2016. What this, um, so let me just show you, this is, So here's a good piece. Everything here in pink is things that he has changed based on my feedback or peer feedback. He got feed feedback from four people. And that's how we improve. So we have formative work and summative. We don't just go to a summative task. <coughs> OK, so there's always a formative stage. That's where you give the feedback. I don't give much feedback when I actually mark the work. OK, that's the way to make our lives manageable. We also need to sleep and live a little, teachers. Um, because I don't think they read the feedback once you've evaluated the work. OK, I, that's, that's my feeling. Uh, I just use the criteria. Um, and he's told me, he's showing me here. But, so if you go here, you can change this to editing, which I love. Because you can edit your work and track your changes. You can see what you've changed. So the next time he writes in the same genre, he'll go back, hopefully, and look at it. That is the hope. But it goes in somewhere. All right? Any questions about the portfolio or the platform before we do this? Yes. Hi, uh, Yes. Do you set any time frame for the, uh, uh, for the portfolio updates? For example, yes. you give instruction how often should they update their portfolio? I, I find that with teenagers, again, if I'm not standing there on, on their head and saying, we're going to reflect now, it's very highly, it's highly likely they will not do it. So I give dedicated class time, 10 minutes. We do, I call that, this a reflection pit stop, just like we're on a race. And we're going to stop. We're going to reflect. It's really good for them. It's good for me as well. I walk around. I look at them. It gets them calm and focused on you value if you value it make it part of your classroom practice you can't just drop it on them say and go home and reflect and build this this is co-constructed and valued in time in class okay so i'd much rather cover less content and have more process that's another reflection from being involved in the real world of writing okay thank you yeah hi i'm catherine hi catherine I'm yeah. And could, is it possible for us to take a look at the comments given by the peers? Uh, yeah. So what do they say about this work? Uh, I have to go back to an older piece. Hold on. I'm trying to think. Uh, pair work. Where would they have? Okay. So I try and keep. Oh, uh, no, this is the task sheet. Sorry. It's, they use the same letter of feedback. It's four sentences, those four sentences. But let me try and find an example. 
in here research. Mm. This was a comparative task. Again, oh, this is the task sheet, sorry. I might not have kept the, I would have to go into, there's so many documents. Uh, I can find this while you do the work. I'll find you an example of student feedback. I have plenty, it's just it's not here because this, so with the portfolio, I get them to think of a published piece. So the thinking is you don't put all your formative work there. You put your best pieces there. Okay, so the polished pieces. So we have a lot of classwork, which I can pull up, but it's, I have to go into my Google Drive for that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, just one thing I'm interested in, because I've tried to use, uh, I, I, try, I do a similar thing, but I do it in Dropbox. Yeah. And I have uh, encountered some problems, and if you don't mind, could I share this with you? Yeah, sure. Because when I ask the students to give feedback to the peers' work, and it seems to me that um, there are some typical problems that I encountered. The first Such as? Is, uh, it's probably too short. For example, uh, this is good to stop. Okay, yeah. to stop. And for some people, if I say uh, maybe you could write longer and make it a task, for example, I give one marks. Um, if you could complete the task, say, giving feedback to three of your <coughs> peers, the work of your peers, mm -hmm. and they try to copy the one that, because they could, they could see that, they could read their peers. Yeah, and feedback, and then just copy and paste that. Just copy the feedback again yeah. and change we face the work and it seems to me that those we've so familiar with that's why um yeah it looks familiar from one another right and i that's why it's, uh, i would like to to know if there's a the experience here you. so i haven't had that pro i've had the first problem that you mentioned but that's why i make it made it part of my classroom practice so first i model for them what good feedback looks like then they will give feedback to each other and I will give them feedback on their feedback. How meta is that? Okay. Once I feel that they have that, my students don't try to copy. They're, they're still young. They're, they love each other's work. They're, they're, they don't, they're quite individualistic, if you know what I mean. Because they write a piece. It's their piece. And they're, they're friends with each other. It's smaller, intimate groups, about 20, 25 students. So perhaps that's, and they don't view it as a thing that they have to do after class because it's done quickly and in class. But that getting to that quickly and the level of detail took practice. It is, you have, to, I do a whole 80 minute session on doing feedback and then I go home and give them feedback and the quality of their feedback. And it's constant reminder, some will try. Some will definitely look for the easy way out. That's good. If I, but they know if they use that, they're going to get it from me. <laughs> you know, like, really, I, it's, you have to value this. And my department now values this. We've taken this on as a department because we realize the, the power of this, the, uh, changing it from product to process. If you value the process, they, they will, you know, they will get on board. But yeah, with the copying, <laughs> If I see them do it, well, you, you're not going to put this in to turn it in. Uh, I don't have an easy answer to that, unfortunately. Thank you. Was, Just a up yes. Is the task that for the audience, the reader and the writer is the same? The? Is the task that the, reader, the writer needs to do is the same with the reader? Yes. Right? OK. All right. Yeah. But they have to be, so for example, they're writing a short story. It has to be unique. They, they won't be able to copy from each other. OK, so there is time that they work. They have their, that's why the portfolio is only shared with me. There are some ideas that don't get shared publicly. OK, and we have Turnitin. Everything goes to Turnitin. So plagiarizing will get caught like that. It's a habit. We do that from grade 6. All right. So that means that they are free to, uh, they could be the, they could write their work uh, and they give comments to the artists, or yes. maybe they could read the work from artists first, and they write their own. Right? No, they all have to come in with a piece to put, all right. and they they're pretty good about doing that. Okay. They all nobody just comes there, steals some ideas, uh, creatively rehashes. No, no, it doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. Um, but you have to make sure that doesn't happen. 
I, I don't think it's perhaps harder to do in a bigger group. But at the end of the day, I talk to them about integrity. And I say, yeah, if, you know what? There are many ways to even cheat, turn it in. If you want to do that, go ahead, fill your boots. What, what are you going to get in the end? Who, who are you lying to in the end? You're, you're developing yourself. And perhaps working with younger people, you can still have that influence to a certain degree. They will listen. Yeah. And I will talk to them honestly. Yeah. You know, In the beginning, when I began to write, I was looking at all my literary greats. And I wouldn't say I was copying, but I was trying to be inspired by them. I had to let, you know, leave all of that behind and find my own writing voice. That took me a while. But you, when you're feeling insecure, you cling on to it. That's why the safety is important. Mm -hmm. If they feel that this is a safe space, they will take a risk. Mm -hmm. They have to take an intellectual risk. They have to share something intimate. And I, I keep talking to them. We always have a couple of students who are really weak, who really should be in language acquisition class because we do have differentiation um, for that. They're not ready to produce text in English yet, but their parents push them through. You know. Somehow they've managed to get through the language acquisition exam and then they're there. It's the, usually the insecure ones who try that. You have to work with them and say, in the end, you're fooling yourself. You're doing this for you. You'll have to write for the rest of your life. You'll have to convince people, whether you're writing a creative piece, um, a nonfiction piece, your whole life. I have to convince my 10-year-old twins every day, my husband, almost every day, you know. So it's, it's that skill of being articulate. And that's what I tell them. This, this is a life skill. So if you want to cheat, go ahead. <laughs> you might even fool me or the system, but you won't fool you know, yourself. In the end, you're, so that's the integrity piece that you have to play. In my school, we have a, bi a wonderful bilingual system of uh, values. So we have Chinese values. And they are, they're there on the walls, but occasionally I just say, these are not just meant to be laminated, these are meant to be lived. But they are younger, so I can yeah. force them to think a little a bit more. Do you guys have turn it in? Yeah, OK. Right. Any other questions? Please ask, yeah. Could I skip back a bit? Yeah. talking about uh, the feedback groups you're a member of. So you've got about sort of four people or something like that. Yeah. I wonder, you know, how trusting, believing of, of, of small numbers of people giving you feedback one, one should be. I mean, if you, th if you think about commercial authors, I mean, J.K. Rowling got knocked back know, many times. Or, yes. You know, Kerouac was, was savaged by the critics. You know, I think Truman Capote said, of him, uh, that's not writing, that's typing. You know mm -hmm. I mean, if you listen to something like that, it's just given up. OK, yeah. Um, so first of all, um, Hong Kong Writer Circle is a great group of people. So you've got to trust the people. There, I have gone the first gr critique group. I realized it was all about slashing everybody to shreds. And I just said, I'm just beginning. If I'm in this group, I will never write again. I knew it. I could sense it. And I said no to myself in my early years about this writing thing, and I didn't want to go through that again. Moved to another group, found a more supportive group in the sense that they were more balanced. Mm. OK? Uh, so trust is important. Um, number two, it took me a while to figure out my, to hone my instinct, to figure out which part of my story was true to me. I could not give up on. OK? What was the beating heart of my story? And what was an appendage that I could you know, yeah, edit and work on. That's when you find out your writing voice. That's how you find, even if people are saying, yeah, and you know, some said, you know, this is, men will not enjoy your literature, it's too floral. I said, okay, that's fine. Half the world will read my books, maybe, <laughs> right? So you have to decide at that point, okay, what's your signature style? Uh, but I challenged myself, you know, I said, I, I could just go down this path, but I do also want to appeal to make my, so to, to generally classify or stereotype, I would say male, more male driven texts tend to be more plot driven. And more feminine texts, let's say, tend to be more detail oriented. Again, vast generalization, forgive me, stereotypes. 
but this was the feedback I was getting. So I had to strike that balance and I found it made me, I wasn't changing the core of who I was. I was fine tuning the bits in my engine, so to speak. But if they'd not given me the criticism, I would not have known to find that voice. You need a critical appreciation of yes. critics. Yes. And in the end, you've got to, you will be rejected from in the slush pile. You will be. Yes. And you just got to, you, you realize you're doing it for yourself. Yes. Her opinion as the leader. Yes. And I said, this sentence is too long, mm -hmm. but this one's fine. And it yeah. was too that she commented on it. So, so I think that peer feedback is really difficult because they don't trust that peer to be better than them. But if they're getting the same, better, if they're getting the same, that triangulation is important. If three people are telling you that, and depending on the task, your awareness of audience changes. Perhaps in another text type you could be using those longer sentences, but if they're not listening to three people saying the same thing uh, to them, then perhaps they're missing. They'll realize that at some point. But perhaps I should edit a little. And sometimes I, there are things that editors have told me, and I've gone, okay, you obviously are not my kind of reader. You have like a reader in, in your mind. You start to develop your ideal reader who might enjoy you, but you also try and stretch yourself a little, so it's that tension. But yeah, peer feedback, but that's where the community of trust comes in. It takes a while. It didn't, this did not happen overnight. It took me about, I would say, one year to figure out a trial and error, what was working, and now it's like a well oiled machine by December. So we start in August, by December, they get it. They absolutely are in. The thing, the ownership is phenomenal. Okay, so the, that's where you put, inculcate that love of reading. And I tell them, if you're not reading, you can't write. So I'm not telling them even to read, but they end up reading because they want to be inspired. They want to see different, and something shifts. If I get to work with students for three years, amazing. Even those reluctant ones who copy and try to get out of things and all of those, even they are writing, but they usually end up writing more text types, not so much fiction. I would definitely say fiction is for serious lovers of literature. Okay? No, sorry. Yeah. Um, if you allow me to do some elaboration, I don't yes. mean that my student is trying to cheat. Oh, no, no. We all, we, we all have lazy students who are just trying to get out of things, and yeah. I think we all have them in our classes, right? Yeah, if you allow <laughs> just me. checking, not just me. I mean, um, probably sometimes students uh, don't have anything in their mind. Mm. And I just think that if they're just working with the same, um, start in the same, I mean, if the writer, they could choose to be the writer and the reader, and maybe their ideas could be influenced by each other. And um, it's not about mm. cheating. It's oh, I understand now. Have anything in their mind. Thank you for clarifying that. Can I just explain then? This is what happens. I have digital time and analog time. When we are in the production of idea stage, there are no screens at all. In fact, I'm not a big, despite using technology, it's a language I've learned, I'm not a big fan. I'm, I'm a big fan of pen, blank pen, and uh, blank paper and pen. You know, that's my preferred medium because I think that's where the thinking happens. This is a great editing tool. So when they do their idea creation, each one of them is sitting with their writing journal and writing. They're not sharing anything at that stage. You will often see them. The first time I tell, this is amazing. I see this every year. Our students are so used to being told what to write all the time. All the time. You tell them, open up your notebook and write anything you want. They will just look at you. They'll wait. Tell me what to do. I'll do it. Don't, you know, there's, there's this gap, this awkward pause, and, and they look at me, anything? Anything. This is how I start my writing class. Um, they will stare out, uh, out the window, sometimes for 20 minutes, tapping their pen on paper, 
until something comes. It may, may not be great. It usually is, and first drafts are uh, not great. And then they have something. When I s ask them, OK, do we have a paragraph we can put? I start very small. One paragraph. Can we put one paragraph on a Google Doc? And then I walk them through the um, uh, ladder of feedback. When we have, we first create that text, but independently. Does that answer your question, Catherine? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, Kind of like crutches till they're walking. Feedback right now because there's, you're right, they don't know what to say. I mean, even I have that same problem. It's like, okay, I told the third, you know, the 20th student the same thing, you know, you need to elaborate here or whatever. So it's pretty much cut and pasted, right? But, you know, um, and also I sometimes I appreciate it when the course coordinator or whatever says, here's some feedback you can use and that, that's useful. So would that be, would they, can I mean, change your mindset about whether it's cut and pasted? Maybe I didn't put it very clearly. I'm sorry about that. It's not about copy and paste. I, I mean, it's about the time that the writer and the reader start together. If they, if the writer, um, if they could choose to be the writer and the reader, at, um, I mean, well, maybe it's about um, then the one who start to read, to, to, the, the one who write, uh, in the later stage might be better because they read a lot of people's work and uh, no one is, will be willing to be the first one. Actually, I tell my student that it's okay if you want to cut and paste because it, it, if it is your real feeling, it's about your comments. And the problem is if I, uh, for example, I say something, okay, this is good. At this point, you realize that this is, uh, this could, apply. you have used the rule one and uh, appreciate it. For example, student one, student one write this. And if student two, if you agree with this, it's okay if you copy and paste, but you need to think about anything. Uh, this is unique. But it turns out that all, everyone, um, I did not know how to make it clearly. I see, so you have four people, or three people giving you feedback. And the first one's the first one to give feedback. And then the next one just go, yeah, I agree, that's the same. And they're not giving any unique feedback. And the third one say, yes, yes, I agree yes. too. And yeah, so the, so the third one can be very <coughs> easy. And if, I don't agree that, I, I'm not sure if she's about whether it's lazy or not. But it's just about, um, it's, I think it's all about the timing, because she write it first, and she took it. And the idea but if, I, if I may jump in here. Sorry, time is limited. I agree with you. I think it's about giving, if you give them a bank, they'll have a range of starter statements. It's like having crutches in the beginning when you don't know how to walk. And then those statements are for them to copy and paste. But later on, you take that crutch away and you say, OK, now what do you think? Having an opinion on a piece of writing is as important as being able to write. They're all connected. And maybe require them to find something Say, uh, you agree, you agree with what they say, or, but find two more things that are different. Comment, make two new comments or something, require that from student two and three. So, unfortunately, my, thank you, and thank you. We can talk more later. Yeah, sorry. Time is up. Sherry is signaling to me that my time is up. I had intended for you to either write a little paragraph or give me feedback. If you scroll down, <coughs> you will see. This is my, um, you have access to this document. You can actually practice using the ladder of feedback. If you like, you can email yourself this link. I will keep it open. So it also has the ladder of feedback there. And this is the first draft of my opening story, which was in the anthology 
which had um, Tale of Two Cities, which was 12 stories from Hong Kong, 12 stories from Singapore. And this one was about urban beekeeping in Hong Kong. Okay, so you can see my first draft. And after, if you, if you scroll down, you'll see the ladder of feedback here. And then this was the published version. I'm still not happy about this. I'd love your feedback. It's the most precious gift you can give me. I'm still learning this art. Uh, you'll see the difference that the, I got feedback from three people um, in my critique group. And uh, that you'll see a difference in the quality of my writing, the level of detail. So that's a description of a young man standing on, on a rooftop in, in Kowloon as he contemplates suicide, but don't worry, he doesn't die. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for coming. I'd love to chat with you later. You can always email me. Shari, you have my contact shared with everybody. I'd love to chat with you, meet with you, share more resources. I can send you examples of how my students, give. I can send you snapshots. Thank if you email me, I'm happy to send you anything and everything. That's how we learn and get better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.